Мене звати Альона Ляшева. Hello everyone, my name is Альона Ляшева. I'm the co-editor of the Commons Journal and also the member of the Social Movement Социальний Рух Organization. And today I will be the moderator of this section of our conference. We'll talk about housing policies within this conference for Bach 11. I would like to invite my colleagues and activists to talk about their work, the work they're doing at the moment, to share their research, to share their findings. Unfortunately, we are doing this for the first time in this kind of uh, conditions. For us people investigating the question of housing, this is a very important topic today. And also we see it as an very problematic today for Ukraine. Today, the theme became intertwined with other problems. For example, within the previous section of the conference, the participants talked about the energy system, its stability and, and independence in Ukraine, and also mentioned the housing buildings that are energy efficient and high quality and modern. Unfortunately, today, the question of the right to the housing is connected with the question of the rights of the IDPs in Ukraine and also with the rights of refugees from Ukraine abroad. And unfortunately, there is quite a lot to discuss. There are many problems in this sphere, but it's good to see all of you here. It's good that we have the strength to carry on our activism, um, our social activities, defending the right to housing and so on. Um, so we'll have two hours. All in all, first of all, there will be three speakers presenting their presentations. Uh, first of all, Anastasia Bobrova from Sados, then Helena Sukhomuch from the initiative New Housing Policy. And then um, we'll have Olesa Ditsko talking to us. She is from the, um, she is the, she has a PhD in ec economics and she is the deputy head of the NGO. Center for Societal Innovations. Me, myself, Alona, Yashava, and also from Lviv. So I think that um, what the Lisa will tell us will resonate um, with me in this respect. This context is special for our city, the context of the housing problems. So we'll mention Lviv today. Um, although Lviv is, of course, not the only city which uh, is now hosting many IDPs. But anyway, um, I'd like to draw to a close with my introduction and Anastasia has the floor to start the discussion. Um, hello everyone, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the chance to be here today and for organizing this conference. This is especially important today. And hello to everyone who is either watching us now or will watch this later in recording. I'm going to share my presentation with you. Tell me whether you can see it. Can you see the presentation? Can you give me a sign? All right. So today I will talk about the housing in Ukraine, I'm telling about what the situation was in Ukraine before the war, how the war affected the housing sector. And we'll also focus a bit about the state housing policy before the full-scale invasion, and also um, about the social housing. And finally, I will tell you about the possible alternatives or suggestions or recommendations um, on how we could change, reconsider the housing policy in Ukraine. Generally, when we talk about housing today, um, it's first of all because we are undergoing the greatest housing crisis in its history. Probably that's the housing crisis, which is the biggest in all European history since the Second World War. Thousands of houses have been ruined, millions of people have lost their um, housing and the war, the damage, these are ongoing continuing things. According to the estimates of the World Bank, today, uh, more than um, 800,000 house, uh, residential houses have been ruined, and 38% of those cannot be restored. But any kind of statistical data we now have in Ukraine is, of course, outdated. Right, the next day, update has been 
published because the shelling and missile strikes against Ukrainian cities continue. Like today, for example, or last Monday, every day, basically, houses are being ruined all over Ukraine, including in Kyiv, so any kind of data. Um, like this data from the World Bank published at the end of September is no longer um, relevant, loses relevance very often. So um, that's one of the biggest challenges we're facing, to, facing today. Any kind of infrastructure, including housing infrastructure that we are renewing today, for example, can be ruined tomorrow. So in order to talk about any kind of long-term planning, um, any kind of sustainable reconstruction, we need to arrive at the end of the war. We need the deoccupation of Ukrainian territories. And then only then we can be certain that the infrastructure we renew or build um, will remain there, will remain standing. So today the losses in housing sector amount for approximately 40% of all the losses in economy. And according to World um, Bank data, again, in order to renew or restore the housing, we need approximately $69 billion, which means that it's 20% of all the funds that we need to collect for restoration and reconstruction. Housing, of course, um, is, of course, um, a question about people as well. According to the IOM estimate, estimates, 6.2 million people became IDPs in Ukraine. For these people, the question of housing is really urgent. Uh, approximately 19% of IDPs need help with housing. Um, the majority of those are renting housing on their own. About 4% approximately live in collective centers for IDPs, which means that these are kindergarten schools or gyms formerly, which have been uh, adjusted to uh, secure the needs of the IDPs. And housing, of course, is also a question um, which has to do with work, with earnings. And uh, in the case of IDPs, this is an urgent situation. According, according again to IAM data, 29% of IDPs had to change their accommodation and move into a worse kind of accommodation in order to save money. Uh, only 5% stayed in the accommodation that they um, started occupying after they um, were forced to relocate. So this question for IDPs is, is really urgent. They are not the only people who need housing. Of course, there are people who never moved anywhere in Ukraine, but their house, for example, has been ruined. And then there are homeless people. And the interests of these groups are often not paid attention to by Ukrainian politicians. Um, so generally, uh, what are the means, the methods of reacting to the problem today to ensure that people are provided with housing? Several strategies work at the lowest local level. The main one being um, local authorities um, decided to um, um, provide the housing uh, by uh, adjusting the existing premises of schools, kindergartens, other places like dormitories or hotels that are not used. Uh, in order to use them as accommodation centers. I know that right now, for example, um, holiday facilities are also being um, adjusted to provide accommodation. And then you have, for example, mod the construction of module towns. Uh, I think there are currently three in Ukraine. Um, then there are some flats um, bought by the um, national authorities. And then there is the Prehistoric Shelter Program, which encourages people to host IDPs. Um, and uh, 450 Prevnias are paid per month to a hoster who decided to um, give accommodation to an IDP. Right now, they're talking about raising the sum of money received as compensation by the hosts. But um, currently, the funds haven't been secured yet. So as we can see, all of those methods, instruments exist, but they target specific needs. They are not really um, part of one comprehensive system. And we need that. We need a comprehensive plan on how to ensure that everyone who needs housing gets it. Um, of course, all of those problems we're talking today have been caused by the full-scale invasion, full-scale war of Russia against Ukraine, but the, root, um, the roots of those problems and problems actually go back to um, 2015, for instance. And 
I would say that generally they, um, these problems are caused by the um, priorities within the accommodation housing policy that national government in Ukraine is pursuing. So what are the main tendencies within the housing policy even before the war? Uh, in Ukraine, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, people started to privatize their dwellings on a mass scale. Um, so now we have uh, the situation where in 90% of all accommodation, um, people living there are the owners of this um, kind of accommodation. Um, this also created several challenges. It means that the um, management of the housing is not really effective. Um, the people who own the accommodation do not really, in many cases, have enough money to um, repair, renovate um, their dwelling. In many cases, before the war, um, the accommodation, the houses never really were repaired properly, uh, which means that uh, we arrived at the war um, situation with accommodation in really bad state. And then the uh, fragmented housing policy in Ukraine is also part of the problem. In Ukraine, we have programs that encourage buying um, of uh, new accommodation through, for example, loans, mortgages, mortgage programs, and so on. Then there are some programs um, with the help of which people could receive um, accommodation free of charge and privatize it later, perhaps. But uh, all of this uh, led to um, the fact that alternative variants of um, acquiring um, accommodation, like rent, for example, or social housing, were underdeveloped or were completely ignored by politicians. And generally, the housing policy in Ukraine um, has been and remains uh, not comprehensive. The main ministry in charge of the housing policy is the Ministry for the Development of Communities and Territories. Um, but at the same time, uh, when it comes to the accommodation for IDPs, a different ministry that for the re reintegration of the temporarily occupied territories is in charge of that. Um, all the groups um, when it comes to accommodation to them, different ministries, different departments within ministries are in charge of that, which means that the system is not um, comprehensive, is not integrated. Let's take, for example, homeless uh, people who receive some kind of shelter. In a short-term perspective, this works for them. Long-term, there is no solution for their housing needs. And again, um, housing policy in Ukraine um, supported the building um, of new accommodation, new residential houses, which means the interest of developers, which means that very often big Ukrainian cities uh, um, became the epicenters of conflicts between developments and communities. Corruption, protest, these are quite um, common things within this process. So for example, we have a green zone, which is claimed by the um, developers and being built up. Uh, this uh, is still happening even during the war. Um, so the methods which have been mentioned by me earlier, like around um, such methods underdeveloped, and then the question of renting accommodation is not regulated when it comes to, for example, the price of rent and the rights of people rent and accommodation are not particularly well protected. We saw this especially um, acutely at the start of the war when people needed to move somewhere and to find accommodation quickly. Um, the rent prices, especially in the Western regions of Ukraine, rose dramatically and the rep representatives of the local organs of authority had no instrument um, at hand to react to that, apart from shaming the people um, who raised prices. And then in Ukraine since 2015 have been no systemic decisions aimed at ensuring that IDPs receive accommodation. The question of accommodation for IDPs is not new for us. It has existed for some time, but no systemic solutions have been arrived upon. In Ukraine in 2015, we have already had the experience of um, producing and setting up those module dwellings suggested as a temporary solution. However, uh, even in 2022, people still live there. Um, the problem with those dwellings is that they are basically temporary. They are not well integrated with the rest of the infrastructure in a certain locality. So people felt uh, separated from the local community. And I think this 
experience uh, has been quite unsuccessful. And uh, it seems to me like it's been continued right now. Uh, again, when we're talking about module dwelling, ready-made um, constructed cities or towns and no um, real solutions have been found for the problems I've mentioned. Um, social housing in Ukraine, this direction has not been developed. Um, the quantity of um, social accommodation units is um, very limited. And this is a problem I would also like to discuss in detail. So um, formally on paper, we have um, social accommodation in Ukraine. Uh, we have laws adopted to this purpose, but unfortunately there has uh, up to this day been no program on national level supporting the social housing, which means that um, this is something that the state declares but does not really pursue. So um, generally in Ukraine, if we take the data from January 2021, we have over 1,000 flats that um, are part of the social housing. Uh, in Kyiv, for example, we had only 72 such flats. Um, we are talking about um, the quantity of social housing, which is definitely not enough for the needs. Um, and here is um, the map which shows us um, which regions had um, how much of those social flats. So in the east, as you can see, there is a bit more social housing than in the west of Ukraine. But um, I would say that um, the number for each region, for example, 180 uh, or 158, this is not, uh, this is definitely not enough. And then a lot of um, those units of social housing um, are now on the temporarily occupied territories. Apart from social housing, we also have something that is known as temporary housing in Ukraine. Um, it functions in a very similar way to social housing. Um, it also appeared in Ukraine uh, at the start of the 2000s, and it was planned as the accommodation for people who cannot really uh, pay mortgages. Since 2014, the temporary housing solution has been working to ensure the needs of the IDPs, and then there has been a subvention created out of the state budget, a national budget, money was supposed to be paid to local communities to develop temporary housing. Uh, we don't have, however, a separate dedicated um, financial instrument for that. Um, in uh, January 2021, we had uh, approximately 2,000 flats that can be classified as temporary dwelling with uh, over 3,000 people living there. Uh, majority of whom were IDPs. And here is the map showing us the um, distribution of temporary dwelling uh, in Ukraine. We can see that in the, in the East, um, the, well, there are more units of temporary housing than in the West. The development has been slow. Um, the problem with this kind of dwelling as well as social housing is that the responsibility for developing this kind of dwelling uh, is the burden which the local communities have to shoulder and they don't have enough funds um, despite the sub subvention, the financing instruments suggested by the state. Um, local communities had problems with access to it um, and could not really shoulder the burden of financing here. So the existence of um, these two funds, temporary dwelling and social dwelling function in a similar way had to ensure that vulnerable categories of population, people with um, low level of income would have um, dwelling, but basically um, uh, this was not enough for the vulnerable categories of people in Ukraine. Today, why do we talk about social dwelling, social housing again? Um, I think that with the full-scale war, we clearly see that Ukraine is in dire need of social housing. And um, we need to um, move up. Uh, we need to really ensure practical methods of implementing social housing as a solution uh, in Ukraine to serve the needs of different categories of people. Um, the need is uh, 
are clearly recognized not just by researchers and activists, but also slowly coming to the attention of the government. Like, for example, at the Lugano conference in July, the minister, um, the minister of the Ministry for the Development of Communities and Territories remarked that Ukraine needs social housing and temporary housing, and the plan for the reconstruction of Ukraine states this as well. I think that this has to be the key priority of uh, uh, rethinking the national housing policy. Um, today in Ukraine, unfortunately, we still have no strategic plan, comprehensive plan of the development. There are some projects um, functioning, existing on the level of some ministries, like the compensation of rent prices, for example, or projects uh, to insure mortgages and loans uh, to specific categories, but these are just pieces of a puzzle, plus there are, in many cases, not enough funds to finance those programs. We are in need of a more strategic point of view, and I think that developing um, this is important. What can we do right now in order to improve the work of the Fund of the Temporary and Social Housing? I think we need, first of all, to unite the Fund of the Social Housing and Temporary Housing into one housing fund and it should be owned um, by the state, uh, lessening the burden on the local, for example, authorities who are now in charge of administering, uh, managing the affairs of two funds. So we're talking about the um, decrease in the administrative burden. And then we need to create an, an opportunity um, to assess how many people need housing right now this is something that's been assessed in three different ways. There are three different registers with the data not being updated also um, on time. So it's even difficult for us to talk how many people are in need of housing solutions. And then I would say that we need to improve the system of managing social housing on the local level because local authorities are in charge of this. As we have seen from our analysis and from the research of our colleagues, um, local authorities simply do not have the financial and human resources to take care of the problem. Plus, we have this um, situation of crisis, which means that local authorities need support from the government. And then we need a program aimed at developing social and temporary housing and um, financial help. These are just a couple of suggestions. They have to do with social housing mostly, but of course, my main point would be that today's Ukraine is facing um, this kind of crossroads where we see the need uh, to reconsider the housing policy in uh, Ukraine. On the other hand, we are not quite certain how to do this. Um, it's said very often that at the center of the housing policy, there should be people, their needs, not the interests of the developers, not the interests of big business. And the housing policy should be centered um, around the problems of the people, the people who lost their houses, have nowhere to live. So our first task before we um, talk about the implementation of some specific um, recommendations is to ensure that people who need uh, housing right now have access to housing in order for them not to be left in the cold um, with a common venture. Thank you for your attention, and we hope that um, I hope that we'll continue talking about this during the Q&A part of our event. And also, I'd like to say that my report is based on the research conducted by me and my colleagues at SEDOS. You can also have a look in detail at those studies on our website, and then you can ask me questions if you're interested in details. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Anastasia, for your report, which managed quite well to cover a lot of topics. Thank you for the focus on what we need to do with this alternative, um, alternative solutions to housing crisis. Although we have been talking about housing policy, housing problems for quite many years, I'd say that in comparison with
Um, if we look at the changed conditions of this problem becoming more and more urgent, I think that it's very important that we can still conduct research and suggest some solutions. And our next topic is on the one hand, something that emphasizes the fact that social housing works, but not always in the way we want it to work, but um, it's a good opportunity to talk about social housing. And we're going to discuss this topic with um, Helena Sukumut, who will talk to us about how social housing policy works in the countries that are hosting and will probably continue to host um, Ukrainian refugees because we are talking right now about a potential new wave of refugees coming from Ukraine to Europe. So I would like to give the floor to Helena. Thank you. Галино, ми тебе не чуємо. Так, вибачте, сподіваюся, тепер чуєте. Sorry, I hope you can hear me right now. Okay, I'm setting up my presentation. So, hello everybody, thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here because I have noticed that the topic of the refugees, migrants from Ukraine isn't well publicized and I think this topic is important not only for the countries that accept uh, Ukrainian refugees but also for Ukraine because this will explain to the Ukrainians in what way the social system should work and uh, the housing access must be organized as well as in what way they are able to understand whether they can uh, hide somewhere from the war, whether they should come back to the area of hostilities. So I am glad to share the preliminary results of my research and to tell you more about refugees from Ukraine in Germany. All in all, Germany has accepted over 1 million refugees from Ukraine it is the second country in Europe. As for number of Ukrainian refugees, the number is still growing, not only because of the hostilities are increasing in Ukraine, but because the way the road of a migrant isn't very straightforward. Many refugees keep on traveling in order to find the best social security. So Germany wasn't a very important country as for exception the refugees in the beginning, but its role has been on rise. And historically, it's one of the countries that has been accepting the largest number of refugees during various crises in Europe. And you can see the numbers relevant to various German lands, mostly these are Western and Southern German lands that are hosting the highest number of Ukrainians and they're also home for most Germans. So right now I'll tell you about the system of uh, distribution of refugees in Germany. First of all, refugees get the temporary protection status According to paragraph 24, as it is called in Germany, it was not used any time before this war in Germany, although the law has been in place for quite a number of years. This law stipulates the provisions for Ukrainians being in Germany and there are still many experiments among the localities that accept Ukrainian refugees. 
as of Ukrainians compared to refugees of previous years, Ukrainians enjoy better conditions. And you can check how they're housed. So first they're housed in centralized centers. Uh, the refugees cannot choose one. In the beginning, these are usually various hostels where there are several people in one room. In some cases, refugees are not allowed to leave these hostels, at least those uh, that come from people like Kosovo and other people, uh, countries that are believed to be quite safe then they are transferred to hostels where they also stay in uh, rooms with many people and then they are transferred to other housing if there is a positive decision as for provision of shelter for them so ukrainians have no these obligations to stay in a stipulated place for some time, they are not obliged to not to leave these places. So Ukrainians arrive in a decentralized manner and they are allowed to choose whatever location they like. They may choose either some centers or some other housing. All procedures are simplified because refugees from other countries usually have to wait up to several years for a positive decision. But Ukrainians, since the 1st of June, they have access to this decentralized housing and they integrated into the social system of Germany. So they enjoy the very same rights and terms of all poor people in Germany in general. What's that decentralized distribution of refugees, decentralized provision of housing? So, as opposed to the refugees, Ukrainians that enjoy the temporary protection, they're allowed to choose the housing. They may live anywhere. If uh, they are able to pay for the housing, they can travel to other regions in Germany, because in Germany, Refugees are not allowed to actually to leave the region where they first registered for three years. So there are various social centers, job centers, and then people have to stick to some social municipal housing for the refugees, but still not many localities, communities have this type of housing. There are also some social apartments that belong to municipal companies. There are, there is no furniture in those apartments. It is usually meant to be used by poor Germans. There are some private apartments that uh, work in this way and uh, the team to perform a social function. And in some cases, uh, the owners are obliged to lease these apartments. And of course, the refugees can live in uh, some standard house and they can rent whatever they want if job center approves their choice. For example, the small 
town has the compensation of 438 euro per month for a small studio of 45 square meters. It's below the average price of lease, but still it's quite possible, but the sum isn't that big. I would like to state that in Germany, the refugees are being distributed according to some quotas. This is the map of quotas, but as Ukrainians have no limits as for traveling between various regions, they could travel to whatever region they wanted, but the housing is an important factor of migration policy as the terms of being registered in a particular city for refugee usually actually depend on the availability of housing. For example, Berlin has announced that only particular categories of refugees will be allowed in the city and up to six months. In this way, housing is the way to control or expand the inflow of migrants. And uh, if Ukrainians have no access to housing, then they are treated according to the rules of uh, refugee seekers, of shelter seekers. Then they are like tied to their housing. They have to stick to those places that can provide them housing with. So whether they have apartments or whether somebody has to provide them apartments. There is also information where the refugees lived. So most people did not actually live in hostels provided by the government, most lived with their families or with their friends, but also leased apartments from private owners. Also, some people stayed in hotels. Lots of hotels provided accommodation for refugees. There is an example of a story of uh, some women refugees from Ukraine. They had no contacts in Germany. So what was their way in Germany? These are stories of three women. One of them had a disability, so she needed some special conditions. So first they lived two weeks in Berlin, but they couldn't stay there. Then we, they found themselves in a center of distribution in adjacent federal land. They spent there several nights. They could not ch choose the room, nobody was helping them. They had some needs, but they had no help. This uh, distribution system was quite harsh. In some way, it was against person's will. They couldn't make choice. Then they were accommodated in a gym. Nobody told them for how long they were supposed to stay there. They couldn't understand what to do next. Then via Instagram, they found volunteers and these volunteers played a crucial role in finding accommodation for them. They helped them to leave this governmental system. And in this way, they got to the hotel where they were allowed to live for free. So they needed the inclusive accommodation. Then they moved to a room in a youth center. 
all of this housing had inclusive accommodation which was much more comfortable and after that the volunteers assisted them in getting a roomed studio but it is paid for by the government so in some way it has come back to the governmental assistance system and all one should understand that there are some challenges regional difference is huge in germany so the accommodation types vary a lot so uh, there is difference in availability between small towns and big cities it's much harder to find something in berlin for example there is big dependence from the volunteers from the civic society but on the other hand this is the way to get rid of the governmental system to, of dependency from the governmental system so the way of refugees depends a lot whether they find some volunteers who are ready to help or if the volunteers are ready to tired then the refugees will not get enough help so there is a dependency whether it is a man or a woman with some children whether they are educated whether they are rich or not everything has impact on the way they will get some housing or not so the more privileges you have in ukraine the better contacts you might have and better chances to find good housing you might have so the volunteers and civic society are then crucial in providing good accommodation and still volunteers have some bias they may choose those people whom they want to help more and in this way some people might have better access to the housing but even those refugees that get apartments sometimes they get small apartments that then that they actually need quite often people get studios like three or several people in studio sometimes with children with grown-ups it isn't quite comfortable and there is still a housing crisis in germany lack of social housing lots of people stayed in some towns as well just provided them with accommodation but still those people cannot get some permanent accommodation so what are my conclusions i want you to remember that the german system of providing housing for refugees is a system it is a complex system there is clear understanding who and where has to live municipal authorities play an important role and they take actual decisions that are implemented and civic society can also influence the situation so the housing is connected to the migration policy and possibility of community to accept or not to accept the refugees that's why access to the housing is some kind of a local activism and solidarity however the access to the housing for the refugees still shows some discrepancies and some inequality everybody should be treated the same but still there is some difference and access to the housing is limited by the general housing crisis in germany there isn't enough place for everybody that's it thank you for your attention lena thank you a lot for your nice report actually lots of people who 
became volunteers in Ukraine in the beginning of full-scale invasion, invasion, helping to people who were fleeing from the east, from the south of Ukraine. So some people thought that that would be great for people to live abroad. But then it appeared that after the first weeks, months, people started asking what was going on abroad, and it appeared that quite often we appeal to the European experience as good standards, which are supposed to be implemented, especially when I speak about social housing. But as you can see, not everything is that great in Europe. As in many countries of Europe, social housing is uh, in the background of uh, some general governmental policies. But really, in some years, in some decades, social housing was taken huge percent of uh, housing in general, but at the moment, it's much lower. So some Ukrainian refugees found themselves in the situation that it wasn't that easy to find accommodation. So thank you a lot for describing the situation, what's working, what's not working, because it's really important for us to know in what way, in what conditions our citizens, our compatriots live abroad and what we should do in Ukraine. So I also appreciate how we have spoken about volunteers Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. And that's that part of the social life that accumulated various issues that Anastasia has spoken about. We had no temporary, we had no social housing. It was some kind of a chaotic social policy and people were moving to other towns and cities, in particular to Lviv. Right now I mentioned in my own experience from the city of Lviv in Ukraine. I understand it's not that unique, but still these informal networks of mutual assistance were able to accumulate huge portion of this crisis. But still, it became clear later on that we could not just help, we had to request for help from the government. Thinking about this, I actually found the interview with Olesya Datsko, whom I haven't met before, Although we were dealing with the same issues and in the same city, both of us are activists, we are capable to word demands. So let me give floor to Alessia to speak about the situation in Lviv and the demands, requirements from the civic activists to the government about how realistic they are and how grassroots policies must be implemented as for cooperation with the local authorities. Speaking about uh, I would like to address my foreign listeners. So listen about our experiences in Ukraine. Lots of people still don't have place to live. So Alessia, floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Greetings. And I can share my screen with you, right? You can see it. So this is my presentation. Can you see it? Wonderful. 
All right, so first of all, I'd like to begin from saying that I'm not just a researcher, scholar, I'm also an activist. And I cooperate with the, um, the fifth platform um, initiative. Um, these are the people who um, met and helped people arriving in Lviv will became friends and this helped us also this networking communication to understand the problems in this sphere um this statistics um the statistical data that i found is that more than five million ukrainians became idps so let's say without the temporarily occupied crimea there is um let's say 41 million of ukrainians so ukrainian populations that means that the number of idps amount to a great portion of Ukrainian population. So what we have right now is humanitarian catastrophe, I would say, because to ensure that the rights and the needs of people are not violated are met, this is very difficult. So the right to housing is guaranteed by the constitution of Ukraine. And probably the first issue that the state uh, needs to address in the context of this humanitarian crisis is ensuring the right to accommodation because this is the right which is um, connected to e ensuring that uh, a person's um, right to safe and secure life is met it's impossible to do the latter without the former um, housing is not just about the uh, for example premises of social housing you receive um, you also should um, have this uh, supporting social infrastructure, sports infrastructure, access to the utilities, etc. Without these aspects, your right to housing, to accommodation is not fully implemented. Um, so we saw, on, um, based on the example of Lviv, when the module ready-made city um, was constructed in Lviv, with many local residents actually protesting against us, and now um, local authorities are thinking about where to relocate people um, housed there because this kind of module um, box type housing is not meant to last the winter. It would be impossible for people to stay there. So this raises the question of investment, which was particularly not well spent. Um, this is something that is difficult to talk about and was difficult to talk about before the war. If we analyze the housing conditions uh, in Ukraine, we would see that one person is entitled to, for example, um, 20 square meters. Plus, if we are talking about a family, not a single occupant, then uh, you have uh, 20 square meters more. But in many cases, um, we see that uh, people only have access to much smaller dwellings. So basically the right to housing was not implemented even before the full scale invasion, before it started in Ukraine in the first place. The state is ensuring, is creating this basic level of providing people with housing um, through different um, principles and mechanisms right in the law, but we have no comprehensive policy to ensure that there is social housing corresponding to the standards um, in Ukrainian law in general, no program, comprehensive program targeting the problem of social housing or its absence. Based on the example of Lviv, here are the problems that we're dealing with, but I think that similar problems are also seen in different other cities and towns. And this has to do with economic, social activity, um, the environment, and so on. Let's start from the fact that IDPs who are registered as IDPs basically became part of the territorial community of Lviv. Um, in Lviv, we have a, a number of dormitories where those people could be housed, and then we had some shelters. But um, this is not enough to deal with the number of IDPs coming to the city. So we started to analyze um, the um, housing potential, and this is what we found. So let's say we have a hotel, 
on one of the streets of Lviv. It's not functioning, no one lives there. Um, and no one is asking any questions about why we have this empty building whose owners uh, don't need it right now for immediate use. So in the conditions of war, perhaps we could um, house IDPs then. And then in the very center of Lviv, let's say we have this um, house which was transferred to the property of the Moscow uh, Patriarchate Church, but right now it's also empty and it's not being used. So why not use it for uh, IDPs, for instance? Um, it's not just about um, a house, one house, we have other houses um, as well. Uh, in particular, um, these two examples, which I gave you, they are in a very good conditions. They're all the houses, but they are built um, much better than many new builds in Ukraine. So um, this is um, this is what is being done. We have, for example, the um, building of the hospital, municipal hospital, hospital repaired by the local authorities um, for palliative care. And basically, it could also be used to um, house IDPs. Um, basically, this is um, quite a good spot, quite a good building in the center. We really have access to social infrastructure, but no one is looking into using um, this uh, building in order to solve our current urgent needs. We should have a different kind of structure, uh, which is um, owned legally by um, the city. Um, and no, no one is uh, using it uh, in any way. Um, against the background of all of that, the local authority is asking the questions like, where can we house the IDPs? But um, here are those buildings, like the buildings I just described for you, where we could invest into repairs, which is much less difficult and much easier than building um, a house in you and laying all the groundwork of um, access to the main utility services. So, yes, we often have um, houses that are dilapidated, um, that we cannot really look after, although they are protected as historical monuments, but then there are quite good mon um, houses that we could use for IDPs and to meet all the urgent needs, but it's impossible for some reason. Like, for example, the owners of a certain house bought it and are not repairing it. It continues to um, degrade over time. Um, the owners plan to wait till it collapses and then build something new. This is absolutely irresponsible behavior. It's a building which is not used by the owners. Why don't we, the municipal authorities, I mean, why don't we um, take the building and use it for the IDPs? After one of my presentations where I shared the information, um, the owners who um, heard about this started talking about the um, restoring, reconstructing the building, which is also fine and good, but why not uh, use um, this kind of housing fund for um, current needs? Um, there are houses that you can reconstruct, that you can partially rebuild, and some of the um, municipal authorities, like for example, members of the local parliaments starting taking up such initiatives, but not enough is being done. Um, I can give you all the examples as well. There is a building in Lviv which is currently being rearranged, readjusted in order to house IDPs. Um, but then there is this interesting question, like for example, um, the municipal utility services, most of them in this city have been closed down. What happened to the premises? What happened to the buildings that um, previously used to house their offices? Um, can we, do we still have them in municipal property? Can we use them if the city still owns them for IDPs? So this is what I would like to stress. Today we have the law adopted in Ukraine, which says that if the housing is not used by the owner, 
um, this kind of um, housing could be expropriated by the state and can be transferred to meet the needs of the IDPs. Um, this will be accompanied by the compensation to the owner. This is a mechanism. This is a mechanism much easier for the state than building houses and you for IDPs. I know that in Germany, like um, for example, um, some of the examples mentioned by um, the previous speaker, um, the lands of Germany have this mechanism also in action where they can um, transfer a certain building which is not used by the own it to meet on the urgent housing needs. We could also do that in Ukraine. We have the constitution, we have the laws, the legal framework for that. And then there is the decree of the cabinet of ministers, which also makes it um, a possible mechanism which we could use. So the problem is that IDPs um, in many cases are not proactive in this. Um, those that um, are active very often find housing on their own. Um, in many cases, people are rather passive and they are just waiting for someone to take care of them. I don't know, it's probably a mentality and mindset issue. I would also say that probably many psychologists working with IDPs today say that it's a huge problem um, the very specificity uh, inaction of um, of IDPs, and then there is the distrust uh, to um, government, and then there is corruption, which means that uh, many donors from abroad, um, because they mistrust governmental structures in Ukraine, are um, reluctant to donate money because they are afraid of its misuse. And then we don't have enough transparency and documentation in this sphere um, when it comes to housing, um, the proper registers, the proper way to document um, databases listing the houses. Um, this is somehow um, not an aspect which has been taken care of. Looking at Lviv again, according to the current laws in Ukraine, um, the municipal authorities should have a register of all the houses um, and lands uh, in the um, city, but unfortunately this hasn't been done, which means that there are some land plots and then there are some houses where their owners pay no taxes and basically carry out no obligations. Since 2015, we have a new register of property and um, unfortunately the majority of property is not listed in this register so we don't know even activists don't know um, how many flats we have in Lviv. it's impossible to assess because there is no um, comprehensive database uh, that database even the um, financial police don't have that and um, the registers of property have been closed after the start of the full-scale invasion um, to, um, as the authorities say, protect the um, private ownership and the confidential information, but this makes the situation even more difficult. Um, basically, um, people who profited from the construction of housing um, are developers, uh, construction companies, um, so um, they uh, have their interest taken care of, but people do not profit from the situation with new, new housing, new construction sites. And then there is a problem with the utilities, um, the burden on the utility services and gas mains and so uh, on in the city is overwhelming. Uh, and then, of course, that leads to problems with um, environmental safety, social safety and so on. What can we do with all of that? I tried to look at the um, example of historical examples of, for example, Canada or the USA taking care of the needs of refugees fleeing from Ukraine. Um, first of all, um, mutual aid like cooperatives um, were a solution, which means that there is some kind of organization set up um, ready to provide uh, aid uh, to people from the same community. Um, the people 
who really um, have some urgent needs. So I would say this model was the best possible model of uh, help. However, we don't really know about these models, about such mechanisms. We have no programs uh, in Ukraine to stimulate development in this direction. So um, the work of uh, NGOs and volunteers, um, this, uh, this is the kind of mechanism that really works today in Ukraine. The majority of IDPs in uh, Lviv are people who were um, firstly housed in some shelters, uh, find proper accommodation that answers their needs through volunteers or their acquaintances. Um, to share one example with you, uh, we took part uh, in a project where we looked for houses in uh, villages around Lviv, uh, finding houses and um, allocating them to IDPs. So we need one um, comprehensive program of um, um, finding houses that are standing empty and ensuring that they can be transferred to the communal property, municipal property, in order to then be allocated as the um, housing of the IDPs. Then again, uh, we can more rationally approach the um, existing housing fund. Again, drawing on historical examples, I would say that um, after Lviv became part of um, Ukraine uh, in 1939, approximately 3,000 flats were transferred to um, the Soviet authorities and received new owners and occupants. In many cases, you have grandsons and granddaughters of those owners who arrived in 1939 into those pl flats living there, which means that you have a huge flat with maybe one old lady living there. The rest of the flat is standing empty. Right, so there was this problem with the slides. I'll try to... I'll try to make sure that you... I, that I can share the rest of my slides with you. All right, so can you see the slides now? Which slide is it now? Sorry. Can you see the slide now? Okay, so I'd like to leave through the slides very quickly. I think you know now what they refer to. I refer to the constitution, the standards of the UN. I talked about the Lviv, uh, giving you the list of dormitories, for instance, where IDPs were housed. These are the um, places that I mentioned where IDPs could be housed. The offices, former offices of municipal utility authorities, um, mentioned NGOs working in this direction. This is the example I mentioned recently with um, looking for empty houses in nearby villages. Okay, so this is um, what we were talking about. Um, the IDPs need to understand that they um, have to be proactive. I do understand that there are older people, people with disabilities, they need to be helped. But then I would say that younger people have to come together and organize those um, NGOs or uh, funds uh, in order to uh, tackle the problem of housing together. Very often, it's also necessary to um, organize, formulate, organize requests uh, to local authorities. Um, when local authorities are not doing anything on their own to uh, deal with the problem of no housing for IDPs, IDPs need to, um, or people working with IDPs need to um, ensure that mechanisms for submitting such requests work. So I would say that um, in many cases, the IDPs have to take care of their problems on their own, but the state has to also shape the instruments they could use. 
um, I would suggest such mechanism as creating um, cooperatives for the construction of housing and creating charitable funds that could function um, such programs, um, developing uh, smaller towns, and then um, engage in volunteers in the um, uh, classification and registering the property in order to make sure that um, the empty properties can be used for IDPs. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. It's a pity that we have this technical problem with the slides. But thank you. Um, this has been a presentation giving us a very clear idea of which problem, problems exist. Um, the presentation given from the point of view of someone who is not just dealing with this program, problem researching it in on an abstract level, but dealing with it very specifically, practically. Um, personally, I uh, didn't need the slides because I um, am familiar with the buildings and I think that the slides gave us very clear um, indication for those of us who are not from Lviv, what kind of buildings we're talking about. So let's say you're living in shelter in an IDP, and then you see an empty grand building um, on the same street, which makes that you start wondering why you're living in cramped conditions, many people sharing the same space, and then there are many empty properties that could be used um, as shelter for the IDPs. So yes, this is something that local authorities need to really um, take up for discussion and deal with. Um, as to questions, because we have this um, time for Q&A now, I'd like to start from the questions submitted on Facebook by uh, one of our listeners. I think this is the question that Helena could perhaps start answering. But also, I would like to expand this question a bit. So our listener, Natalia, is asking where the volunteers in Germany find information about housing for migrants of any kind of category. I would also add to that question. Um, first of all, some additional questions. First of all, how, who are those volunteers? In Ukraine, we understand that um, people help Okay, so at a certain point, um, I'd say that the line between helping you, helping your friends and um, your family and helping everyone else has become blood because um, because of Russian full scale invasion, a lot of people lost their accommodation. Um, so you're helping your mom and then next day you're helping someone from Mariupol. Um, you're doing the same kind of um, things, you are taking the same steps. In Germany, who are the people volunteering? Probably they're not just Ukrainians, but also Germans and other migrants, other refugees. Uh, perhaps Helena could tell us more about volunteers in Germany. Who are those people? What are they doing? Um, are they successful in their efforts? Yes, thank you a lot for your question. I've been a volunteer in some self-organized center for the refugees distribution and housing location. So really lots of people are engaged in volunteering. Many of them have some roots in the Central Europe or Eastern Europe. So they're quite solid. They show solidarity with people speaking Ukrainian or Russian. Lots of activists work in the fields of racism, refugees and housing refugees, also human rights. But as for this approach, uh, this uh, wave of accepting refugees, there were lots of families, lots of people who were eager and ready to accept refugees at their homes. Those were old and young people 
well-educated and not so well-educated university professors. Some people had their grandparents. Some old men were part of National Socialist movement. And so they wanted like uh, to show gratitude to Ukrainian people. So there were the most various people. And this wave for accepting refugees was really huge. The number of people unfortunately decreased with the time because people got tired of uh, this wave of refugees. And I think uh, the same was going on in Ukraine. It's also an answer where people get information about refugees. All in all, the German system is based on the contact of local authorities and volunteers. The same happened in 2015. And all these self-organized volunteers, at least in my city, they were in good contact with social services with the youth center and all of them helped to sort, to distribute the priorities because they've been working in the field and the town wanted to support the volunteers because it was beneficial for the town itself. Free accommodation, free people, people working for free. It was great cooperation of volunteers and local authorities and they were in communication. They got information from the first hand from the local authorities. So once again, the whole system is very regional based. Everything is different in big cities like Berlin. There, were, there is more formal organization there, like characters organization, but still even big organizations, they cooperate with the local authorities. They get the info from them and they pass this information to other volunteers. Thank you. Thank you a lot for your answer. The next question, we've spoken a bit about it in the previous section about energy, but still, People brought it to attention once again, so maybe it is quite relevant. Anastasia, I think you can answer it, but anybody else who has the answer, please raise your hand. Also, guys, join us in Zoom. And if I see you, I can give you the floor. So please use the controls. So about the energy efficiency of the housing, the housing must be energy efficient. Somebody must be responsible for this. Somebody should pay for the utilities. So I think the question is relevant to to some social policies in the housing and something is going on. So which institution or what actors must be responsible for energy efficiency, for paying utility bills and so on? I think I can start giving an answer, but I invite my colleagues to give their answers as well. Yes, it's an important question. All kind of recovery or reconstruction must be energy efficient. But the question is not only about materials, but also about development of sustainable system for everything to function well. Let me come back and say that Ukraine has no sustainable financing system. 
many owners didn't have enough money in order to make capital repairs of their housing, even if there was a condominium, if everybody was working jointly, still they didn't have enough money. So lots of housing is outdated in Ukraine. Speaking about the recovery, we should understand that if we just rebuilt the housing without the system of collecting money for reconstruction, we'll get to the same issue. In five or 10 years, the housing will be outdated and it will need repairs, but no money for it will be available. So speaking about social housing, it might be owned by various entities. Currently, it is mostly in municipal ownership, but such housing might be also privately owned. But the main factor here is that it should be non-profitable. Either it is privately owned or by some fund, doesn't matter. Any profit should not be used for profit, so to say. Still, people are supposed to pay for social housing and the profit should go for paying bills, for reconstruction, for repairs and so on. I think that's important. Ukraine is still from, far from the point of speaking about various sectors in the social housing market. We still need a push from the state, from the government to get the first finance for the cities to start the project. But still, these are local communities that are supposed to handle the money. As a moment, social housing in Ukraine is rather marginalized. It's available for a very small category of people. And due to this, very few people are ready to support it because lots of people understand they cannot count on getting the social housing. But if we have enough social housing and more categories of people uh, can have a right to get it, then people would be eager to pay for it. And in this way, it will be self-sustainable. But it is a long-term perspective. Yes, thank you. Really, we have lots of questions at the moment by various channels of communication. I'll try to put all of them into discussion. Katarina is asking us about the cooperatives for construction. She believes that not IDPs, but local authorities should start them. Therefore, we'll need a new law. Let me ask Olesya about such cooperatives. I know that there is just one cooperative that was able to construct, to develop a house. I think that house was built by the IDPs, at least by their initiative. Those people moved from the East, but they moved from the East eight years ago. It means that the whole process took quite a time. Although they had initiative group, they had no support, but in eight years, they actually were they actually succeeded. I think it was the city of Vinitsa, but I'm not sure. So my question is about the ownership. What about cooperatives? Are they realistic in Ukraine? Anybody can answer. Anastasia, maybe you have been dealing with this question as well. So what about the ownership of 
cooperatives? Is it feasible? Is it doable? Many people still expect they can come back to the newly liberated regions. Some of them might find their housing still intact, but still, cooperatives, they're not 5 EPs only. They're relevant to everybody, at least for those who have the finance necessary for construction. I'm sorry, it's so hard for me to put all the words into the question. I have so many ideas. So my question, are cooperatives a good form of ownership? Can they work well for Ukraine? Do they have advantages, disadvantages, pros and cons? Alessia, please share your ideas. Can you hear me? Yes. Let me join this with another question. Why do we focus on IDPs quite a lot? Yes, IDPs are great uh, because they were able to resettle, but they should continue being active. You see, when appointed people uh, have the highest economic activity level in Western Ukraine. In the 1930s, it was time of cooperatives. What's a cooperative? It's when you have a small part or resource that you can allocate to some service or goods made by the cooperative. In the Soviet Union, there was an organizational form of use cooperative those were very good in providing housing for young people. Young people were building houses for themselves. As of today, it's also a powerful tool. I do not agree that the government should be involved in cooperatives. Government should not be part of that. They should just start everything. They should start with the mechanisms, but they are not supposed to be founders of cooperatives. Otherwise, those would be municipal houses. We have state, municipal, and private ownership in Ukraine. If it's municipal house, then municipal authorities are supposed to build it. If it is cooperative, then it's a completely different case. So. For example, the authorities might provide a lot of land to build on, but then they say, get the resource, get the finance and build a house and it will work. If we analyze how much money is spent on modular towns, modular settlements, you'll be amazed. So much money was wasted. What should we do with those temporary housing? Right now they sell. They tell us, let's buy potbelly stoves. That's also expensive. If people work together in cooperative, they got acquainted, they have common cause to work at. So right now we have this mutual project, a research and the major issue here is not about getting accommodation, but about being socialized again, because people were desocialized. Cooperative is the way to resocialize people, for them to work together, but it's not that beneficial for oligarchs and for the corrupt authorities because it provides independency for people, because the cooperative founders are its beneficiaries. It's not good for the corrupt elites. I've been investigating, I've been researching the history of cooperation in Austria, two 16 farms with just two or 16 cows. 
work together, but working jointly, they start a plant, a farm, a big farm, and they can survive. Our credit unions in the US and Canada, they're still active. It's extremely efficient and effective way of co-financing. Nobody told us about that. As far as I can see it, if you have a house that cannot be finished, give it to people. People would complete this construction and other people will be get to help because the charitable foundations are not eager to give the money to the government. And this can be a push for small business development as well. So condominiums are great, but cooperatives are almost the same, where you can find a cooperative. We have some cooperatives still founded in the Soviet Union in Lviv, and they're still functioning, and it works well. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. So, Nastya, the floor is yours. I know you have some ideas. So, thank you. I was also considering this question. On the one hand, I would say that cooperatives have many advantages or less attached upon them. I think that when we talk about the reconstruction of housing, we need to understand which priorities um, we have. Probably um, people who can take part in the cooperative with people who have some kind of starting resource, starting capital, they need help, but there is something that they can start working with. On the other hand, there are clearly people who cannot, um, do not have um, such opportunities and resources. So how do we ensure that their needs are met as well? We don't really know much about our IDPs. Who are they? What kind of resources do they have? We have some data gathered by, for example, the World Bank, by some ministries in Ukraine, by some volunteers, organizations, but we don't really know what kind of needs they have, what kind of resources they have, into which categories we could possibly divide them. Then there is this risk um, connected with cooperatives. Uh, we have discussed this with our colleagues from Hungary studying different forms of ownership. So this is what they see in Hungary. In order to start the cooperative, um, you need an effective mechanism of uh, insuring financing. This could be loans, this could be mortgage, this could be some other kind of financing source. But this is anyway an important question. This could be a problem for us. In order to start this cooperative movement and for it to work, we need to understand how, how we can support this kind of movement financially. Thank you. So we have been talking when discussing this topic uh, during other events about our priorities. And the priority, I think, is not to create just, just one um, form of ownership, which is the best. Uh, we can clearly see that private ownership is a solution that in many cases is not working. Individual private property, this form of ownership is um, the predominant one. It's not really working well. And during war, we see all the disadvantages of this form of ownership, all the hidden problems in full. For example, when we look at what happened with the house and flat prices in times of rent in the west of Ukraine, when, for example, a small one room flat in Lviv could cost up to um, $1,000 uh, with the owners asking the people who had rented the flat from them earlier to 
relocate to a different space in order for the owners to be able to rent it out to IDPs at a much higher price. So this predominant private individual form of ownership is really a dead end. Uh, we need to think who needs the housing, who the housing is for, the housing being built, someone can perhaps buy a flat, someone can take part in a cooperative or, or organize such a building cooperative. Some people, on the other hand, currently have no resources, no job, no place to where to live. Um, and in order to restore their access to decent life, we need to ensure at least that they have social housing. So social housing plays this kind of role. It's not a coincidence that we call it a social housing. Its first function is to ensure that people um, are not out in the open air. They have some kind of roof over their head. And this should be the, come the platform um, from which the person can then launch their own Um, search for housing for decent life and also help other people in the process. Today we also talk that the right to safety and security, the right to safe and secure life is closely connected to the right to housing. We have many other questions. So sorry for taking so much space, but this problem is something that also resonates with me deeply. And we have this question from our attendee and this friend from Germany. Uh, I'm going to ask this in Ukrainian. You can also read it in English in the chat, in the Q&A. On the German left, there is a rising movement for socialization of housing and other key assets as a solution to the problems caused by earlier privatization. As we had earlier in cities, it's difficult and expensive to find a place to live. Socialization is different from nationalization because it involves creating a public body governed by democratically elected representatives of all stakeholders, the tenants, the staff, and the general public. Is there any prospect of such movement rising in Ukraine? Uh, Ian is asking. Ukraine. Um, so, Ian, thank you for your question. It's a very optimistically phrased question, I would say. I would like to maybe start answering that by saying that in Ukraine today, everything became possible. Things that seemed impossible, suddenly we experienced this terrible war in full, um, uh, dire adversity, which disrupted our previous life and things that seemed impossible in the past seem potentially possible now. So we're looking at the housing, for example, from a different standpoint than before. My reply is perhaps too abstract. Maybe someone would like to respond from a more practical, grounded standpoint. So do we have the legal framework for perhaps enabling this um, instrument, this form socialization instead of nationalization of housing? I can answer, perhaps because I studied this question. So we have three forms of property in Ukraine. So you have state or public property. Um, so you have the parliament, the cabinet of ministers, they are in charge. Um, the communal municipal form of ownership. So we're talking about local communities, members of local parliaments and so on. And then you have private form of property, 
we used also to have collective form of property, we don't have it now. In most countries, this form of property does not exist. It's either, pri either private or state or state and municipal in different proportions. When we talk about the socialization of um, uh, property, we're basically talking about communal municipal property with people living as a commune together. And, um, the transfer um, of a certain housing to communes of IDPs could perhaps be a step towards that with local authorities um, assessing that a certain number of people could live in a certain house, a housing project, and then um, taking into account the category um, these people belong to. So let's say the local authorities think, okay, so mostly they will be people with not enough local resources, and then local authorities would um, basically, or should basically be in charge of um, transferring such buildings to these categories of people. Looking at Lviv, I would say that uh, in many cases, municipal authorities transferred um, houses, flats uh, to parties connected to them um, in a form of corruption. But I think this generally is a mechanism that um, have, but uh, I think it's a mechanism which has potential. And then there is, um, there are many cases all over Ukraine with uh, flats and houses where the owner dies and we don't really know what then happens with this property. The mechanism which should work is that the uh, court decides that this should be transferred to the communal property and then the municipal authorities decide what to do with this property. However, I have never seen such court verdicts. I don't really know what happens, but basically it's a mechanism which could ensure that municipal local authorities have an important resource at their disposal uh, in terms of housing. If we look at um, land and property taxes uh, in Lviv, the database of that, you'll see that um, foreign-owned properties, um, their owners pay no taxes, so that's another wasted resource. Um, near Lviv, uh, we have a project ensuring uh, shelter, temporary housing for people experiencing some kind of crisis um, in terms of housing, socialization, etc. for people, for example, who are released from prison. For homeless people, the project is aimed at socializing such people, uh, employing them and providing them with accommodation. Um, but this is not really something you can enforce. This is something that has to emerge based on the local level, based on the local needs. I would also like to add another remark to this. I'd say that in Western countries, the United States, Germany, very often the owner of the housing which is rented out. Um, the owners are actually private corporations. The situation in Ukraine is different. Uh, for us, it's not really a priority to socialize and nationalize the property the way um, it's um, being done in Germany, for example, because we cannot really take the housing away from people actually living in those properties. In Germany, this process started because um, the owners are raising the rent prices, uh, basically have a monopoly over the market, and so you clearly need to impose some kind of control on the uh, housing market in terms of rent. Um, in Ukraine, the situation is different. Olesa is correct in saying that out of what we have, we need to create 
this data and resource for this fund of social housing. And then based on that, we can create a new social housing and build a new projects. Otherwise, we cannot really socialize and nationalize the property of people who do not really speculate on that, but actually live and use some rooms that they don't live in in order to rent them out. Um, so we don't have much time left, I'm afraid. So just a few remarks. Where do we get the resource for nationalization and socialization of um, housing? I would say that we um, could perhaps use the um, mechanism of freezing the assets and resources of um, Russian capital um, in Ukraine. So you have the oligarch Fredman, for example, um, who was born and raised in Lviv and has a lot of property in the city. So it's just a question of investigating and finding the political will to freeze those assets. Again, we're talking about things that um, recently seemed impossible. We're talking about, uh, for example, freezing the um, assets of oligarchs. And that means that we are open to all sorts of new ideas, but would enable us to find solutions which have been never suggested before. I think that um, people in many places like Kyiv worried um, about what's happening in their cities. Um, I'm responding here to the question from Denis, the question addressed to Anastasia, first of all. It's the question about the building on uh, Zelenska Street, which has been um, um, bombed recently uh, and which the local authorities declared to be no longer um, feasible in terms of its uh, reconstruction. Um, they declared that the place needs to be cleared out and the site uh, built in you. But this ignores uh, many aspects of the situation and the needs of the community, like labor rights uh, or the social needs, etc. So how can we um, deal with the situation where because of corruption and commercializing, uh, we are getting rid of the um, houses which could be rebuilt. Uh, I'd like to respond to that by saying that we need to have a look at how the um, houses have been built in Ukraine over the last um, several decades. Um, people writing in the chat, um, whenever you do that, whenever you write something, this disrupts the flow of the uh, meeting. So maybe refrain unless you have an urgent question. So which alternatives can we suggest to um, the developers mafia um, active in the largest cities of Ukraine? Because this is um, the situation we've had over the last um, couple of decades, um, developers um, extracting huge profits either from the state or through loan and mortgages um, very often these are programs actually funded by the state. So the money which comes from private investors but, um, is actually in the first place allocated by the state. So there is them, the developers, those people who profit enormously, and then there are people who have perhaps been accumulating money throughout their life um, to find resources to buy an apartment. That's uh, a painful question for everyone, I guess. I think that um, even though we may be unable to suggest any real solutions here, it's important to at least feel that we are discussing this, uh, discussing it and sort of vent our feelings. Nastya, perhaps you could suggest um, a response, and then perhaps Helena and Alessa will take over. Um, thank you. It's a good question. It's something that I um, think about very often. Uh, we know that what can be a crisis and a dire situation for one category of people can be 
a chance uh, to profit for someone else. Um, as has been noted, uh, in the occupied territory Shrihivka region, we could see already how developers um, are planning reconstruction, meaning that um, they are planning construction that would enable them to profit enormously. It's a complex and a difficult question. And I think we can approach it from the point of view of um, national policies, not just in the housing sector. As uh, Denis noted, this is an important topic which um, um, has to do with our rights to the protection of environment, labor rights and socialization, social rights, etc. I know that yesterday you discussed labor rights within this conference. Today we talk about housing rights, so what can be done in um, this sphere is basically to reconsider the housing policy on the level of the state, to develop other forms of property, other forms of housing, alternative um, forms like social housing, um, cooperative, um, building cooperatives, um, price caps on private rent, etc. If we have diverse housing policies answering different needs um, and uh, corresponding to different opportunities, um, then we would have a situation where this kind of versatile approach is really good at reacting to um, needs of different categories, which means that uh, which means that we would. Uh, uh, damage, uh, demolish the monopoly of huge developers. Um, activists, of course, uh, volunteers, um, social organizations need to play an important role in this process. Um, already with this example um, based um, on Dennis's question, I think we have already a good example of activists protecting the um, heritage housing cultural historical heritage of the city so this is something that can really be done when people protest loudly against such demolition it will be impossible to do i can also give this comment that historically the situation of reconstruction is about instability and it caused some bad decisions in the planning field. For example, in Germany, lots of streets were built in car-centric way so that uh, it wasn't good and it wasn't enough time to think about that. So the situation got worsened. But in some cases, it happened that really uh, the developers got all the rights in these emergencies. So we need to analyze the whole system, the whole management on various levels. What laws, what provisions can be made, introduced, in order to regulate the situation locally and on the governmental le level. International actors can also influence the situation. For example, they may stipulate in what way to use the money. And this uh, stipulation of energy efficiency is very important. For example, those houses that are not energy efficient might not be rebuilt. So we can introduce the most various laws, for example, inclusive zoning. For example, subsidies for reconstruction from the city, but only in the case when some part of the new housing is for rent or social housing. So it's very important that the developers would not use all the money for this outdated housing. All kinds of levels must be involved civic society must put pressure but there are also tools of the communities of the government and 
those of the international actors in order to limit the use of the funds in a proper way. Thank you, Alessia. I'm a kind of anti-developer. I fight for the cultural heritage, so let me speak. First of all, if uh, some house is a historic monument, you cannot simply ruin it and rebuild something new on its place because there are notions of restoration, recovery of the historic monument. So the experts in historic monuments should speak out. Then that house has owners of separate apartments. Although it is partially ruined, other people are supposed to decide what they want to do with their house. For example, they should say, we need, we want to recover it. And they can collect money, they can get donations. Lots of people would be eager to donate in order to rebuild a historic monument. Besides, state protection is supposed to be present here. The Ministry of Culture is supposed to do something. They actually do nothing, sincerely speaking, frankly speaking. And this is the aggressor that is ruining our history as well. These are the issues uh, that are connected to our history that we need to preserve. And we should focus on this. We should make the authorities work. OK, friends, thank you a lot for this meeting. Unfortunately, we have to end it. I'm very happy that we were able to gather together. All of us had power. We had no power cuts. And I hope that at least in short term, our country will be able to deal with this issue, a very urgent issue that we need to be ready, we need to be aware of all kinds of shellings, of missile attacks against civilian infrastructure, and then in long-term perspective, we'll be able to deal with all kinds of issues after this very pressing issue. It's very hard for us to live through this period when we lose our housing, we lose our families, we lose our life as we wanted to have. And right now we have the space for dreams. So we've been dreaming today, but we've been planning. I learned lots of new today from you. So, I also heard some optimistic visions of the future, and it is very important to exchange the way we can see our country, our society in the future, our right to society and to housing. So, thank you a lot for this meeting. Thanks a lot to my colleagues from the Commons Journal who were able to organize this meeting. Thank you to our interpreters. I am very grateful to our speakers and to all the participants, attendees. Sorry for not being able to voice all the questions, but still we have the Facebook page of the Commons Journal where you can publish your comments as well, and we'll discuss them. Our speakers represent various organizations that deal with the issues connected with the housing. They are working every day in this field, and they fight. So please join the Commons Journal Please follow us, follow other initiatives that dream, that demand, that plan. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening.